Thank you everyone for attending. Um, this is a 45 minute presentation. It's going to run the gamut, mostly talking about security testing and wrapped around the concept of breaking point. My name is Phil Trainer, as mentioned earlier. I'm a senior product manager in the applications and security group here at Ixia. I was also a former member of Breaking Point before the acquisition. The reason why Breaking Point exists and security exists, uh, security testing exists in general, is due to the fact that as the complexity of network traffic increases, in order to properly secure things, requires more and more effort to be done by the people who are creating those products. And that's really where the breaking point solution fits in the equation. As you can see by this uh, cyber defense report, I mean, performance and scalability is something that's really a big problem. It's something that is currently being uh, tested by Ixia products such as breaking point all over the world. The product that I work on mostly is a concept called the perfect storm. The Perfect Storm is a network traffic generation tool. I'll talk about it in depth, but I'm also going to talk about security testing in general. These kind of things are always a little bit difficult to gauge because I really want to get down to the bits and bytes there, but also I want to keep the concept high level enough in order for it to be interesting for, all, for the entire audience. At a very high level, what the Perfect Storm product does is a client and a server for up to a terabit of network traffic. That network traffic can uh, encapsulate Everything from social media apps like Facebook and Twitter and things of that sort, all the way up to botnets, denial of service, exploits, things of that sort. I'm going to talk a lot about how different types of content caused problems and how people are trying to stop it and how people are testing for it. This is a typical deployment of a breaking point solution. You can see here the breaking point box is in the middle. The green traffic represents the good traffic and the red, the attack traffic, and it's crucial if you're going to actually create realistic environments, you have to mix attack traffic with good traffic, because it's not enough just to block various attacks or recognize that things are happening the way they shouldn't be happening. It's important to do so without interrupting service to your users, and also it's critical to know what is and is not an acceptable amount of um, latency added by different scenarios. Say, for example, if you're just hosting web content, if it's streaming media, you have a whole different level of tolerance than if you were just putting content up there that wasn't streaming. Or say, for example, you're a stock exchange and adding a few milliseconds and drastically change trades. Crucial to know these metrics. It's something that we can test for on a very high level. All right, a little bit more about the breaking point solution. We do a couple things that make us very useful in the real world. One of them being is every two weeks we have content. Crucial that we do this because things change so rapidly. What was a concern yesterday is not a concern today. With these 26 updates every year, we add new application layer protocols, new attacks, new DDoS scenarios, new fuzzing scenarios. We have a lot of different things that we move forward with. This is actually a little bit old. 250 isn't the correct number anymore. Right now, we're at 288 application layer protocols, and we're getting really close to 37,000 attacks in our system. So we are one of the largest attack databases by, but that's really not interesting as the fact that we're able to do it at the same time as running new and interesting and complex application layer protocols. As I mentioned before, I can hit just shy of a terabit of traffic with this. I can have 720 million concurrent sessions at any given time. And I can also create these sessions very rapidly. I can build 24 million. I mean, HTTP is kind of like a misnomer because I can build any socket for any protocol at about 24 million per second and about 12 million concurrent uh, SSL sessions per second. So it's a very powerful platform based on custom created hardware to do this kind of traffic generation. All right, so what's have a little bit of fun and talk about different security scenarios and how we can create them with breaking point and what they actually look like on the wire. At the end of the day, the burden to stop various attacks is on inline equipment. And a lot of this inline equipment is being tested with products like Ixia. And these companies are like Palo Alto Networks, FireEye, Juniper, SourceFire. I mean, there's a lot of people who rely on this product to create the scenarios that they need to ensure that they can block. So let's start talking about it. Now, one of the things that's very difficult about an inline security device is it has to look at all of the traffic. It can't pick and choose. It has to basically be agnostic and 
parse all of it looking for different scenarios. It can do internal load balancing, other things to spread this burden out. And chips are getting incredibly fast. But the fact of the matter is, as network traffic volume and complexity increases, it becomes more of a task in order to find different attack scenarios. Here are three attack scenarios. I mean, I will never do a presentation without showing a PCAB, without showing actually what happens in the wire, because I firmly believe that if you don't see it on the wire, then it didn't happen. I don't trust logs as much as I trust looking at a piece of network traffic and discerning what happened. You can see in the very first scenario, I build a TCP socket, I send something that is an attempt to uh, execute an attack, and right away from the client side, I get a reset. If I look at it from the server side, I build a socket and a reset happens without the attack ever getting through. This is exactly what you want to see for a correctly functioning inline security device blocking an attack. It never makes it from untrust into trust. However, if I were to employ evasion techniques, like change some hex encoding from ASCII and do things like that, you can see here, this is the exact same traffic going through the system. Evasion and polymorphism really shouldn't be a problem for an inline security device, but it costs more resources. And that's a really large problem because when we're talking about the volumes of traffic that I'm mentioning, where we're in the terabyte, terabits of traffic, then all of a sudden exponentially increasing the amount of processing it takes form and action really can add up. Also, new things are happening all the time. This is something, a screenshot I grabbed a little bit earlier. Um, a whole bunch of different people's Gmail accounts and passwords were exposed. I was able to grab those before they were too buried online, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, this happened a few weeks ago, and everyone's still talking about it. And I don't want to talk about it in terms of, oh, be aware of this. I want to actually look at the bits and bytes of shell shock and say, okay, how would a security device that's in line attempt to prevent something like that? And very recently, Yahoo had a very public news amount, announcement about whether or not they were attacked with shell shock. It turns out it was just a server flaw, but I mean, I never would have believed 10 years ago that there would be this much media coverage for a bug. So this is a piece of Wireshark up here, but essentially what we're doing is we're able to execute things in a very interesting way. Like, I did this a little bit earlier. Uh, you can see right here, oops. Um, everything after the tick can be executed by forcing it into an environmental variable in a bash cell. Let's say that, but you have to have a vulnerable service first. And it's vulnerable for different uh, platforms like uh, Debian and Ubuntu were very vulnerable to this. I tried this attack on several machines in my lab. So you can see right here, if I peel this apart a little bit, let's say you have a vulnerable website running a service. Let's say that search service. You have environmental variable. 20 is a uh, space character, and then the X equals, and then 7 is that uh, tick, and the 20 all the way down to ping to Yahoo, which is just what I was doing. But you don't have to ping Yahoo. You can get much more interesting like you could have done like a W get to one of your servers and down the door. But we wouldn't do that because we are the good guys. How would someone block something like that? At a very basic level, I mean, the easiest and fastest way to do that is to write a regular expression. So this is a regular expression I wrote earlier to block Shellshock. I'm sure a lot of people have looked at uh, regexes and looked at specifically snorts regexes, but this is one that I have uh, done myself just to show for example. And I'll, I'll pull it apart in a second and really dig deep into it. We can see here, it's an alert from any external to HTTP servers, so any external IP address to HTTP servers, which are defined earlier in a different file as what the IPs are of your servers, on any HTTP ports, which is typically going to be 443 or 80, depending whether you use encryption. The message that comes up would be shell shock if this is activated to flow to the server that's fully established in the socket. It's in the HTTP URI and has this right here as a Perl compatible regular expression to match up. So we'll talk about this more. Yeah, I pulled apart a little bit more in this. So we make it a secured event if and only if this criteria is matched. That event could be logging it, blocking it, whatever your system is set to. One of the things that we do here at Ixia is we make sure things work. So I'm a big fan of testing. Make sure things are valid before try. And so I took the attack that I wrote, stuffing that environmental variable just to go in and ping Yahoo, and I put it into this 
little website to verify whether or not my regular expression I wrote to block this works. You can see the match up here works. So also if I stick this into my Raspberry Pi, which does run Debian, you can see that I'm able to execute what I have in there. And this is very powerful that you're able to do this. This is why it's such a big bug because so many different like Nginx and app and all that, it's very easy to run these on Blade servers that are just running Linux. Very clean. So creating traffic scenarios is what Breaking Point does. It creates attack traffic scenarios and good scenarios. And they fit a very wide range of different um, industries. Like for example, um, if I go over here, you can see that the traffic scenario for an office building versus a web portal versus a partner portal versus e-banking is going to be totally different. And having these traffic scenarios all test the same really is not going to give a good indication as to how that system is going to perform in real life. All right, so check this out. I have three different vendors. This is a real test that happened. Vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C. If I just do regular TCP traffic, they're all basically the same. They're almost identical with respect to their performance. When I do just web traffic, vendor C performed better than all the rest. That's awesome. When I do a different scenario traffic, like traffic from a partner portal, vendor C was still good. When I do office traffic of typical things happening in the office, like Citrix, SMB client, MySQL, Oracle, things of that sort, then it's a little bit more even between these two right here. But let's say, for example, the environment this is going into is NAT. Vendor C, uh, vendor B by far was the best solution. If anyone's ever seen network traffic from uh, FIX, the Financial Information Exchange Protocol, it actually looks a lot like Facebook. It makes a socket before the end, the start of the trading day and it keeps it throughout the trading day and it's highly bursty in between as people transactions. It doesn't have a lot of socket creations. It has bursting transactions. And if you're an inline content-aware device that not only interconnects all of this, but it's also content-aware and security-conscious, it's going to be able to process traffic. I mean, imagine if you were a NASDAQ and you did just TCP baseline and web traffic. You'd have no idea if you could possibly buy the incorrect solution. And let's say you were building a solution and you wanted it to be able to be highly functional security device inside an environment such, such as NASDAQ, without testing for it, you'd have no idea that you had performance issues on that particular specific type of So we're able to quantify data, create content, and create the traffic of that at scale in a very, very rapid time frame. This is another scenario that we do very, very well, cyber rain. The federal government is a huge consumer of this solution. So are a lot of other foreign governments. Singapore recently created a cyber range lab. Essentially what cyber range trading is, is I can be basically a system that creates events in real time. So people who are defending different resources can sit at the terminal and then as a training event, we will create attacks. You will see these attacks happen in real time. You will respond to the attack. This whole lesson plan that we have built out is really paired up with our 26 weekly updates of different content so that we're always testing with new scenarios. We're always keeping it current so that your training is always highly relevant. It wouldn't be interesting to be concerned about a training scenario that happened a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. Keeping it that current allows us to create these events, and that's why different governmental agencies find this such an appealing product, especially for this type of testing scenario. I mentioned earlier the scale of this product. It goes up incredibly rapidly, incredibly fast. This right here is a portable version. This is the equivalent of one single blade. It's a concept we call the perfect one. This one 22-pound box can hit 80 gig of traffic and build 2 million sessions per second. And it's able to have a state table up to 60 million connections. And this is something that you can just fit in your backpack. It's an unbelievably powerful platform. It's great for enterprise testing, but it's also great for proof of concept testing. If you could just take this with you and say that you're going to Verizon, you're going to the federal government, you're going to a foreign government, and say, we are the solution capable of defending against these scenarios 
that you're interested in working with. We'll create the content, create the real users at scale, involving encryption and any other aspect you want to. Building users within the breaking point system is like Legos. You can assemble them any way you want to, make it as complex as you want to, and we'll give you per user stats with them. Being able to do that and prove something out that rapidly is incredibly powerful. As a person who is concerned at the CSO level of how are my resources being defended, being able to see a valid proof of concept such a uh, such a powerful thing to show them that this will work and I'll prove it. We have a very wide variety of different protocols we support. This is just touching the very bottom of it. I'm going to talk about a whole bunch more protocols that are more of the newer end of the spectrum. We do a lot of great DDoS. Being a very high-end traffic generator also, at the same time, makes us a very powerful DDoS tool. And that's something that is very important because DDoS is something that's happening, and it can happen intentionally or unintentionally. Traffic volumes spike all the time. It's very possible to create these scenarios in very canned, very easy to work with environment. This is something, uh, I had a question a little while ago by someone. They said that, I mean, DDoS really wasn't that interesting to them because you would need to have an incredibly large botnet to take down their resources. And I said that necessarily was not true. Because as you can see right here, this is a DDoS. I wrote a very simple DDoS with TCP raw. It's just a SIN flood. It's very, very boring. But you can see right here in Wireshark, this is second one. This is one second. And I created 12,000 packets. This is with a i5, Intel i5 chip. This laptop right here is probably even underclocked a bit, and it's about five years old. So with a single machine that's really not all that powerful, I created a 12,000 packet per second DDoS. So I mean, it's not that hard to reach the millions or tens of millions. I don't need a botnet of half a billion machines. I only need a few thousand to get up to those rates. I opening these. I mean, Moore's Law, even though it allows us to create virtual machines on the fly to handle incredibly complex tasks. Moore's Law has also made it possible for very cheap investment to make you a very powerful DDoS. Just for the uh, record also, with the breaking point solution, we can create a terabit of DDoS at incredible. We also have simulations for botnet. I mean, you do want to create that large-scale botnet, we can absolutely do it. Also, this is kind of neat in here. This shows you a little bit of the way the, I mentioned how building a con uh, concept was very much like Legos. This is the way you would just create that. You would have flows of different protocols and add actions to them. And you can peel these apart as deep as you want to. You can create your own protocol if you want to. You can force fuzzing if you wanted to. You can put fields that are invalid in all of these. It's all very malleable in order to change any way you want to. And we do have thousands of scenarios. You don't need to know how the, how Twitter uses JSON in order to make changes. We have a CAM scenario for that. But if you really want to peel it apart and change it, you're more than welcome to do so. We're not based off of PCAP. We build everything out in Ruby. So we have real clients and real servers, and we never repeat ourselves. We have a patent on creating a unique packet within our network processor system. And that's very important, because if you're basing your traffic generation off of PCAPs, it'll be the same thing over and over and over again. And that's not exercising your content aware device. That's just giving it the same thing to look at multiple times. And that'll never be the case in the real world. It would be highly unlikely to see identical flows, unless it was someone just grabbing a splash page of your website. But once you get into more complex flows, I mean, people are doing different things. It's really not responsible to just have one scenario and test that over and over again. Variation is important. We can be unique on a per packet basis at that scale of a terabit. Okay, live product demonstration. See right here, here we go. Let me move this up a bit. This is the real time stats screen of. The breaking point device. I only have a single blade. I'm only running at about six gig on a pair of ports. This is a really cool screen right here. It shows you a hundred thousand foot views of what's going on in the tech. your bandwidth, your frame rates, your aggregate frames, 
Your connection rate, I'm building about 14,000 connections per second. So far, I've built looks like about 28 million connections. I get my latency. We measure our latency with FPGAs. So we have down to 20 nanosecond accuracy on that. I have my app transaction rates. You can see that they're largely going through, but I've got a few failures because I am going through a real device. Power to click over to applications. I can see in real time what apps are doing. So I have Reddit for one. I have just some basic YouTube, some AIM6. I have WordPress, Skype. I can flip between these guys. I have WhatsApp, Microsoft Exchange, VMware vMotion, Pandora. I mean, it's a very enterprise environment showing different things. This is great. This is really cool, but it's not cool without. At the exact same time, out the same port, I have attacks taking place. And so far, I've done 7,800 attacks. And right now, I don't have the um, the blocking features turned on on my device center test because I wanted it to parse a lot of traffic because this is a painful scenario. If I'm running these attacks with those apps at the same time, it's a very difficult thing to parse and look at and be accurate with. And this is the reason why essentially we all have jobs because no one has solved security. It moves too fast, it's too dynamic, and there are too many moving parts to it. It's a difficult thing, but it's crucial that we create testing scenarios and really put devices and solutions through their paces in order to really evaluate risk and know if things work in different levels. And at what level it can block every attack, at what level it starts to have things slip by it. I mean, knowing these different metrics is crucial. A quick glance at the wall this generates and go back here and take a quick glance at the GUI. It's our graphical user operating system. Really like it a lot because it's very drop and drag. It's a high level stats. Open this up and open this up. Essentially, in one solution, we have nine different types of tests I can drag into this. I have apps, I have low level traffic generation, bit blasting. I can talk to real servers, I can recreate PCAPs, do routing traffic, I can do exploits. Security NP, we've moved all of our malware into the same engine that is generating our apps. So now I can send malware at very high rates. The reason why security is still segmented out because I have a very specific tip for that. And the reason I need that is we have about 180 different evasion techniques. Earlier I showed a slide where employing a simple evasion technique got it through a system. And I mentioned earlier, and I'll say it again, I don't think any inline security device should be fooled by an evasion technique. I think that expressions and the engine and everything should be on par to stop it. But what I do think will happen is it'll have to allocate more resources in order to look at something, for example, that's fragmented and out of order. I'll have to buffer the entire piece of content, reassemble it, then apply different regular expressions to it. It's an increase in effort. And that's what's interesting to me. I turn the volume up on regular users and then I use like Doug Song's frag route. I, all of a sudden did that extra effort, did it slip through? It's a very important question. Also, did the entire attack get through? Is the reassembly engine working? I'm a big, big proponent of trying all these things out because you'll never know So you actually form all these testing metrics. Also within security is our fuzzing engine. We can, for those who don't know what fuzzing is at a very high level, fuzzing is intentionally sending out network traffic that has flaws in it. Think like a socket to port 80 that's expecting an HTTP method and you send it not a message. Instead of like a get, you send it just random ASCII, a bunch of hex characters. How will your system deal with that? This is how people find flaws in things by like fuzzing new software or old software and place people make programming mistakes. A little further down, we have Session Sender. You can build sockets in a raw, build raw sockets in a very interesting way. I can make a socket that'll have infinite uh, TCP segments or a socket that has just opens up and then closes immediately. And finally, Stack Scrambler is my random fuzzing. Security, I fuzz apps. and Stack Scrambler, I randomly create content. This content can have bad TCP flags, bad headers, bad uh, lengths, things of that sort. It's very easy to create things like this in this product that are just intentionally flawed and bound to eventually cause problems. Well, let's take a quick glance at the traffic we generated. I like our reports a lot. They're all on Ajax. Take a glance at enterprise apps. 
app data. Very easy to create, very complex, very meaningful scenarios. You want to create a traffic scenario that really resembles an environment that has these different protocols in it. It's all very drop and drag. It took me literally two minutes to make this. The things I wanted to, I put them in the components, just ran. Very simplistic. And we dive very deep with respect to the things that we're looking at. For example, I really want to know what the application transaction rate was for all of my different protocols. Like, what was my transaction rate for Pandora? I don't like it. Like I want to be able to hear all of my music. And we'll show that in the histogram over time. To go further down, I can see things on a lower level. Average time to open a TCP socket. A connection rate. Even down to latency distribution. Take a moment to render this. This is kind of a cool little graphic. It puts things into buckets. You can see that we're below the microsecond level. This right here, I didn't turn on all the things I wanted to on the end. Had I, I wouldn't have had nearly as much traffic get through because it's work to do. But also, this would be much more jagged. If I were to come back to this over here, something I do in my attacks is kind of cool. I can delay them. Let's delay the start of my attack components for Microsoft Strikes 10 minutes. So when I run this, enterprise users which is going at 10 gig at 100,000 users, is going to go for 10 minutes. And after those 10 minutes, I'm going to start the attack. I'll have a baseline of traffic beforehand, and then I'll see how the impact of those attacks take place. I can layer these things go forward so that I have different attacks happening at different times and see how they impact my overall, see how they impact my application response time, see how they impact my latency, see how they impact the, uh, the success of my apps. Do I have complete application success until the attacks start? And in order to block those attacks, I do so by sacrificing my real users. A lot of cool things can happen with this. I can show all of these. At the end of the day, I have a thing called App Profile. This one I call BH4. It was originally Black Hat 1, 2, 3, and 4 I made for our demonstration of Black Hat. I go to the Managers and App Profile. Oh, no reason to say it. Take a moment to pop up. And I just type in BH4 and open this guy up. These are all the different superflows we've associated with that. I just dragged all these guys in and went to run them. If I were to take a look at each one, and see I have Reddit in here, I have Flickr, I have Google Mail, Google Search, Dora, iTunes Music, WhatsApp, Exchange. I mean, it's a very typical environment. Real users. I can weight them differently. They have different uh, scenarios which are going to be executed. And also, if I want to, I can click on this right here and view this particular superflow. Now, superflow is a word that we made up. Flow is, I mean, just an RTP stream or a socket with some content in it. A superflow is something that we invented. It is a meaningful user experience. You can see over here, we have a bit more numbers. I have 16 different state table interactions in order for someone to watch or do something within Reddit. If I were to pull this up a little bit and see in this user experience, I have 73 apps. People logging in, grabbing things, doing things. I mean, Reddit is a fairly interactive process. It's not just opening up a socket, grabbing whatever is on 192.168.1.x. I mean, I will do a DNS lookup on it. I'll resolve that via type A query. And then I'll have the ability for a user just to pull apart and start doing different things. I'll jump into transport security, allow the user to pick different ciphers, upload their own ciphers, their own certs. Inside of logins, oops, let me go back. I can force usernames and passwords. I can add a concept called a dictionary. You can use split dictionaries or regular dictionaries. A regular dictionary is just a list of content that I will force into my flows. 
I've created uh, proof of concepts with millions of items. Split dictionary is a dictionary that has two items. For example, a username and a password. If you wanted me to point this at, for example, iTunes with millions of usernames, say, okay, let's have everyone log into iTunes, see how fast we can do that scale. I can create that test. I can say, you know what? If you have half a million people per second logging into iTunes, it'll work. But once you get beyond that, we'll have login failure. Resource handle it. You need to allocate more resources. We're able to create all these scenarios. A, it's not a, a, a packet blaster. It's an application creator. It, it creates the clients. If you want to, the servers also. We're able to do this at a very high scale with real user data. I could go into this concept for hours. I'd love to talk about tokens, too. Tokens is the ability for us to put in uniqueness on a per basis. So, for example, for username, I really wanted to. I could do pound, pound, lower, alpha, 10, 14, pound, pound. What this will do is every execution of this, even if it's happening in millions per second, it will create a unique lower alpha between 10 and 14 characters. But this is a username. Sure, it's an alpha, but what if I wanted to fuzz this? In? No reason I couldn't put this in hex. I mean, it'd be translated to ASCII. It may not be that interesting, but it'll still be weird, random things in here. And, you know, what if I want to put in 64? I mean, I can create 64 length username at speed. That's an interesting test. What if I'm only going to do lower alpha between 48 and 64 names? Is your performance the same if all of a sudden I'm increasing this le this right here? There's really no bounds to that. Also, I can completely do this. Add a whole bunch of these in here. Now I'm sending in huge, unique usernames. The ability to create concepts with this that are unique every time is nearly infinite. We've created fuzzers inside of AppSim, and we've found flaws in all sorts of different things. It's an incredibly powerful platform. And the same thing applies also to our system. There's no need to save it. Inside of our security attack system, you're able to do the exact same things. You're able to say, all right, find me everything like CVE from... 2014, and I'll find all these different attacks. We'll scroll through them. We capture all of our traffic via our FPGAs and put them into FIFO queues on physical RAM. So I'm able to capture at line rate up to four gig per interface. I'm going to run these attacks. Let's say they get through, and you don't have a uh, alert set up by your inline security device. Awesome. Let's run it again. Let's capture the traffic, and let's see what the disconnect is. I mean, working with your engineering team who's creating your inline engine or your test team or whomever is doing this, it's crucial to be able to pick that PCAP out and be able to compare it to what we're expecting to see. I mean, at the end of the day, we're creating and deploying security solutions, content-aware solutions. It's important to be able to look at the bits and bytes of what happened on the wire and make intelligent decisions and make critical decisions based on whether something can feasibly work or it's 1136. I'm going to say open up for questions for the last 10 minutes. And a question could be, would someone like to see more of X or deeper about Y? Hey, Phil, I have a few questions. Uh, I'm going to remind everyone once more that if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A widget, and you can submit any other questions you might have while I'm reading these off. Um, and, and I'll see them, and I'll be able to read them off to Phil. So the first one is, I heard breaking point is expensive. How much is it? All right, that's a very forward question. Um, breaking point is one of the most, um, I personally think that breaking point doesn't even really cost money. It's, it's a cost-saving metric. I mean, the cost of having a flaw in the field that's very public is a huge problem. The cost of downtime, we work with eBay, and eBay had downtime for like an hour or two, and that would have paid for dozens of breaking point products. It's risk management. 
and in terms of creating huge volumes of traffic, we are the most affordable way to do so. Um, I had uh, someone show a presentation a while ago. We create uh, iPhones also. We'll create the user traffic of an iPhone. And one of our blades will create 6 million iPhones. But we had it down to saying that it cost $0.04 cents per iPhone to create them. So in terms of creating interesting traffic scenarios, incredibly high volumes at terabit levels, I mean, we are incredibly affordable. Um, I was also at another enterprise company about six months ago, and they spent an inordinate amount of money to cobble together a traffic generation solution using Blade Server. It soaked up several people's uh, quarter for about a dozen people, and it cost millions of dollars to create, and we did it at at a few percentage cost of the whole thing. In terms of creating a scenario, there is no better way, cost effective, and more just realistic way to create network traffic. This is what we do. We do it the best part. Okay, so one more question. Does Breaking Point support ATP? Um, in terms of advanced persistent threats, absolutely. Uh, one of the things you can do with the Breaking Point solution, which I had in my previous test, is you can layer different concepts. And let's say that I'm doing this as part of a cyber range training scenario, which we do. Um, it'd be very plausible to run hacks, learn how well they do, run a second scene, a third scene, all the while having to use it. You can use um, DDoS based off the effectiveness of them keep running different attack scenarios. I mean, at a very high level, a threat is a coordinated attack. Typically, a sophisticated group trying different things to be, like, in a coordinated method to be as effective as possible. And that's the crux of our cyber range training, and it's something that we do very, very well. Bill, one more question that just came in from Andrew. How often is the annual threat intelligence database updated, and how often are those updates pushed to breaking point? That's a great question. Um, a slide earlier, we have 26 updates, but on occasion we'll do an update faster. Like when Heartbleed came out, when Shellshock came out, we said, you know what, we don't have an update for another four or five days. We're going to push one out in the next hour. So um, we had an email push out for Shellshock. I believe we had it within within six hours of it uh, really hitting various different sites. So standardly, we will do one every two weeks. However, if something of high interest comes out, we are trying to do it as fast as we possibly can. The order of the time is within 20. Okay, everyone, I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Um, for information to join us for more Tech Talks, please visit our website at ixiacom.com. Thank you, and have a good day. Bye-bye.